Well, a couple months ago, I was reading in Christianity Today about the death of Frederick Buckner, who was a celebrated Presbyterian preacher as well as a critically acclaimed novelist. I had heard the name, but I wasn't very familiar with him as a person. However, Buckner's story really stuck out to me. It was interesting. He wasn't always a Christian. In fact, he spent the first 14 years of his life moving from new place to new place every year as his parents were desperately searching for stable work, which ultimately, after years of unsuccessful searches, led his father to suicide, convinced he was a failure. And so Buckner, hoping to escape the sorrow of his teenage years, worked hard so that he could enter Princeton University, which he did in 1943. But that was ultimately interrupted by his military service during the last few years of World War II. But eventually he did get back to Princeton and, and graduated in 1948 and published his first novel to acclaim in 1950 and beginning a, a professor, professorship of his own in New York City around that time. Now, all the circumstances of his life up until that point led to a, a kind of agnosticism. Buckner was a person that had perpetual doubt in God's goodness, even his existence. But during these years in New York City, he met a man named George Buttrick, who was a Presbyterian preacher in Manhattan. And although Buckner himself was not a believer, he liked this preacher so much that he would regularly attend his church just to hear him preach. And one Sunday after Queen Elizabeth had recently been crowned, Buttrick made a connection to her coronation by saying that unlike the Queen, Jesus has been crowned again and again and again in the hearts of those who trust Him. And here's how Buckner describes hearing that in the sermon. He said in his odd and sandy voice, the voice of an old nurse, that the coronation of Jesus took place among confession and tears, and then as God was and is my witness, great laughter. He said at that phrase, great laughter, for reasons that I have never satisfactorily understood, the great wall of China crumbled in my heart. And Atlantis rose up out of the sea. And on Madison Avenue at 73rd Street, tears leapt from my eyes as though I had been struck across the face. This singular idea in that sermon by God's Spirit birthed a powerful faith in Buckner that Jesus is crowned King of Kings in our hearts when we confess Him either through large tears or through great laughter. And so in his Christianity Today tribute, writer Justin Bailey talks about how this moment in Buckner's life was so formative. He says, I know of no other writer than Buckner who captures what I might call the incredulity of joy. A doubt-tinged hope that insists on whistling in the dark as he puts it. Now all of that to say is that I think this story about somebody who's raised and grows up in such tragic circumstances and goes through life even though feeling some hint of success, still longing and looking for something more. When he really understood that Jesus is the King and the King who comes to us through our confession and our tears and even our great joy and laughter, something broke free in Him. And I think this is what Advent is all about. Because here we are in a very dark time of year. Moreover, a dark time in our history. Nothing is as it should be in this world. And we hardly have to be reminded of that. We think of people around this globe right now, how in Iran they are under the thumb of a, a fundamentalist regime, and how recent protests have, 
have given way to, to all sorts of civil violence. Or we look a little further east and look to the people of China who likewise are controlled by an unforgiving government. This is how people are, are living all over this world. And people in our own country struggle to make ends meet while we read and hear news stories of our young people murdered in our city. And even churches are experiencing churches that are supposed to be uh, an arc from the despair of this world. Even our churches are experiencing suffering because of our record division which casts doubt in people's minds. Things like culture wars or political extremism and most insidiously of all, things like the moral failings and sexual abuse of Christian leaders have made churches even feel to people like a place that they can't truly call home. And all of these things have led many believers down the paths of deconstruction and doubt. What if this church isn't what it really claims to be? Why would God allow all this suffering and sadness, not only in this world, but even amongst His people? And most devastating of all, what if Jesus really isn't who He says He is? These are questions that real Christian people are struggling through today. And for those who find themselves asking these kind of questions, I say one thing, don't despair. Because you are in good company when you ask these kind of questions. Because you stand shoulder to shoulder with John the Baptist. Of whom Jesus says in our passage, among those born of women, no one is greater than John. And yet, he is the the same John we met last week. A fiery, breathing prophet who challenged every Pharisee and Sadducee and every dignitary and every royal member of the family and his corrupt government. John was fearless. And yet this week, in the musty air of a dim prison cell and all the sorrow and uncertainty of his life, we hear him rather timidly ask Jesus, who he was just proclaiming last week, Are you really the one who is to come? Or should we expect another? It's right smack dab in the middle of that doubt, if not despair, that Jesus announces good news of a hidden joy for John and for all of us. So let's look at our passage this morning, starting in in verse 2. In this morning's Gospel passage, we find John not preaching in the wide open frontier of the Jordan River like he was last week, but rather now he's stuffed away in a suffocating little prison cell because of his preaching against a sinful king. But reports are getting back to him about Jesus' ministry, about the things that Jesus is saying and doing by way of John's own disciples. So this prompts him in verse 3 to ask the question of the hour. Are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Now, why do you think that John is asking this question? After all, he was just preaching the coming of the Messiah. More than that, he baptized Jesus as the Father's voice and the Spirit's presence came down divinely affirming that Jesus is the obedient Son of God, the Anointed One of Israel. John experienced the power of his own proclamation, the Messiah in his own sight, at his own hearing. He had this authentic and life-changing experience And through Jesus, nonetheless. And yet, here He is. Jesus says, the greatest preacher to ever live, racked by doubt. The reason why I believe 
that John is experiencing something that we can't fathom a strong Christian believer would go through. Moments of questioning, moments of doubt. The reason why is that John, although he was mighty, he was not himself the Messiah. I think we put an unhealthy, an unhelpful burden on the shoulders of even strong Christian people to assume they always know the answers to why God works in the ways that He does. The answer, or, or the, 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 the clear idea that's represented here is that even John, who Jesus thought the world of, quite literally, didn't know all the answers. Didn't understand why God worked the way He did. Even John experienced doubt and discouragement. Maybe that could give us a little breathing room to not be so harsh with one another and with ourselves when we just don't understand the way that God is working. No doubt, John, like Jesus' disciples, was expecting Jesus to do something different than what He was actually doing. I think we too have different expectations of Jesus from time to time. John, after all his preaching, I'm sure was thinking that Jesus was going to do something more politically revolutionary. That He was going to do something more spiritually cataclysmic. Because like us, John was was distraught by the radical, insidious evils of the world. He too looked around at the state of Israel. The state of her people, the state of the world, and knew this is not the way it should be. But someone is coming to change that. But he was baffled when God's action wasn't the sweeping political overthrow that maybe he'd been hoping for. He he, he was caught off guard when there wasn't an angelic flood of justice from God's heavenly armies released on the powerful and mighty of this world. And like us, John couldn't imagine why God wouldn't inaugurate and usher in His eternal kingdom, annihilating all sin and death. He couldn't imagine why God wouldn't do that right here, right now. And so John asked Jesus what we all do in moments of doubt. Are you really the one? Now, Jesus' response, I think, seems strange to us because He doesn't give John the direct answer that maybe we would like to hear. He doesn't say, of course I am, John. But He does speak clearly for those with ears to hear. He says in verses 4-6, through He says this. He says, go and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Those with leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who is not offended by Me. Now this is Jesus' own paraphrase of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 35. Where Isaiah writes, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped, and the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. But what sparks this divine reversal? See, Isaiah is writing to a people that are walking in darkness. That are looking for dawn of the age of the Messiah, but it still seems far off. They're walking in darkness of exile and sickness and war and famine and plague and division. All the things that our world and our society is going through. They're walking in darkness. But what sparks this reversal where eyes of the blind are open, where the ears of the deaf are unstopped, where the lame leap like deer, the tongue of the mute sing For joy. Isaiah writes, A road will be there and a way. And it will be called the holy way. The unclean will not travel on it. 
but it will be for the one who walks the path. Fools will not wander on it. There will be no lion there, and no vicious beast will go up on it. They will not be found there. In other words, those that put their trust in the world and the regimes of this world, the fools, those who try to take advantage and abuse others, the violent, they won't be there. And even nature itself, no hurricane, no famine, no plague, no beast will be on this holy way. Only those who fear the Lord will be on this way. But the redeemed will walk on it, we read. And the ransom of the Lord will return and come to Zion with singing crowned with unending joy. Joy and gladness will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee. This is the passage which Jesus paraphrases and alludes to and preaches back to John. Jesus reminds John of God's holy way. And that holy way is Jesus Himself. That is the path by which we reach that destiny of a new Zion where there are no blind people, no sick people, no depressed and discouraged people, no uh, people that are maimed and tortured and abused any longer because all of that will be undone as they reach this point. And the way they come to this unending joy and gladness where sorrow and sighing are fleeing is through Jesus alone. No politic, no philosophy, no economics, no science, no industry will save us. Those things will not cut a pathway forward. Maybe they cut a pathway down into hell, but not up into the life of God. Only Jesus will. He is the road back to the Father where blindness and poverty and sickness and death are no more. Only in Jesus, the King of kings, will we too be crowned with unending joy. Only in Jesus will joy and gladness overtake us and wash everything else away. Only in Jesus will sorrow and sighing flee from our presence forever. And as Fleming Rutledge writes of this, of these verses in Matthew's Gospel, in his response, Jesus is saying to John that yes, the messianic hour where these things begin to happen has actually arrived. He is saying that the time foretold by the prophet has actually come true in my ministry. That's what Jesus is saying. The time of God's liberation is here. The signs of the inbreaking of God's kingdom are occurring because I have arrived. That's what Jesus is saying to John. Now notice he doesn't say it like that. He says, John, do you want to know if I'm the one? Well, the blind are seeing again. The dead are being raised. The poor are being lifted up. The deaf are hearing again. So you tell me, John, what could this possibly mean? I'm here. These things are happening. What's the connection? And Jesus, I think in a similar way, puts us in that same tension today. He is not showing us before our own eyes and with our own ears, these same miracles and these same signs that a wicked generation demanded. He's telling us this story. He's showing us Himself. And He's leaving us in the tension of faith. You tell me, church, am I the one? The blind are receiving their sight. Those who were entrenched in their sin addictions have been set free. Those families that were falling apart because they were following their own way are being reunited again because they're following after Me. So you tell Me, church, 
Am I the one? Because indeed, Jesus does heal and restore and resurrect. I think all of us have accounts of how He's done this in our own personal lives and our families. But there are also times in which He does not act according to how we think He ought to. At least, not yet. And that is why John remains in prison until the unjust execution that he suffers. But does Jesus leave us alone in this doubt? Does He give us any reason for joy in this very confusing and murky life? So after sending that message to John, He turns to the onlooking crowd who's watching the whole exchange. He turns to us through the Scriptures and asks a similarly piercing question. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? Meaning, did you go out looking for someone that has no real conviction or backbone but doing a sort of entrancing spiritual dance? Did you go out to see a a spiritual sideshow, in other words? Or did you go out to see a partisan court prophet who's dressed in fine, soft robes, the kind that you find in Herod's own court? In other words, the the, uh, equivalent, I think, the ancient equivalent to these prosperity preachers that somehow end up on the President's Evangelical Council of Advisors. Is that the kind of people that you went out to see? Is this who we're looking for, church? Are we looking for people that will tickle our greedy ears? Are we looking for uh, preachers that will justify our political hatred of the other? Are we looking for someone who promises us Some kind of sci-fi utopia that never seems to come? That's not who John was. And that's not who John was looking for. Neither should it be who we're looking for. And although in verse 11, Jesus tells us that there was never one greater born of women than John the Baptist, what happens to John? What happens to the Old Testament prophets, Jesus reminds us? what happened to the New Testament preachers, and what still happens today to Christians all over this world gives us serious pause. Because they give their whole life to Jesus. And sometimes, oftentimes, that life has tremendous suffering throughout it. And it gives us a moment to think, is this really the one whom I'm seeking? Is this really the path that I'm willing to go down? Because even today, Jesus would have us know, this violent world of Herods tries to besiege those like John. Those who live not for themselves, but for the Messiah. Those who have doubted in their moments of pain and sadness and loneliness, yet still look forward to the joy of being released from sickness and prison. Being released from uh, from exile and death. See, these people face the same things that we suffer in this world today. How many of us are battling a serious disease? How many of us are anxious as we try to balance our checkbook, especially this time of year? How many of us are facing opposition from those we work with or our neighbors or our own family for our faith? And how many of us are racked with guilt and grief over how we struggle on a daily, if not hourly, basis to believe and obey? John's world where Christians go to prison, where they sit in moments of silence and suffering is the same as our world today. But for those who belong to God's coming kingdom, because they belong to God's anointed King, Jesus says even those people 
will be greater in the kingdom of heaven. Even the least of these will be greater than John is in this world now. Those who persevere through their doubts and their despair to the end will be greater than John ever was here on earth. The least of us, like John, who cling to Christ, maybe with white knuckles and broken fingernails and with tear-stained faces and questioning hearts because they have ears to hear. Even though we go through all these uh, travails and turmoils and we live imperfectly and we constantly have to repent and be rebuked and exhorted to keep the faith, if we have ears to hear, truly those will experience unending joy and crowning glory under the everlasting grace of the King of Kings. The beauty of the Gospel is not that it is for people that are all put together and once they come to faith, once they're baptized, who never have doubts, who never sin, who never abandon the Lord, who never betray their vows. That's not the Gospel. The Gospel is that you can be the greatest preacher to ever live, John the Baptist, and sit in prison in silence and despair, and Jesus is still faithful to you through it all. That's the Gospel. You will not be let go of by God because of your doubts and your failures. You won't be saved because of your strengths and your victories. We will be delivered from our sins and saved unto God because of Christ's loving faithfulness alone, which gives us joy and every sorrow that comes to us through this world. So here we are on Joy Sunday, or as the 9th century Latin Christians used to call it, Gaudete Sunday, asking the same questions that John and Frederick Buckner and so many others have asked of Jesus in this confounding world of pain and loss. Are you really Him? Are you really the King? Is there real, actual joy to be had in you in this Advent season of waiting between the first and the second Advent? Is there joy to be had in you? And to you who asked that question this morning, not just the people that are most put together, not the people whose family lives you admire or are jealous of, To you, wherever you're coming from this morning, Jesus says, whoever has ears to hear, listen. Through your confession of sin, through your tears of relief, and through your great laughter, remember that He rules the world with truth and grace. And He makes all the nations both then and now in the future, prove the glories of His righteousness and the wonders of His love. Let's pray. Father, as we wrestle internally with the tension that Your kingdom is already here, but not yet in full, may we with all nature our songs employ that in Jesus no more will sin and sorrow grow, No more will thorns infest the ground. Come back to us soon, O Jesus, our joy, our day spring, and our morning star. For it's in You and Your name alone we pray. Amen.